Support comes from Cambridge University Press with the new book by Stephen Watts, Citizen Cowboy, a compelling look at the life of Will Rogers and how his work helped ease Americans into the modern world. More info at cambridge.org slash citizencb. Support comes from the nonprofit Alliance Française de Pasadena. Learn French with the experts. Group classes and private instruction, in person and online, at afdepasadena.org. What the? Desmond, we're going to do another podcast. Yes, we are, Dad, and I'm looking forward to talking about swearing with you today. It's going to be effing good. I know that, in my estimation, much has changed about how people use profanity. I think that's right. I think even within my own lifetime, I've seen some changes. To me, cursing in some places can be absolutely hilarious. It can definitely punch up a conversation, but it can be boring, too. Let's get to the effing program. Welcome to Passing the Mantle, a new podcast from LA's Studios. I'm Larry Mantle, the host of Air Talk on LA's 89.3. I'm Desmond Mantle. I'm Larry's son, and I just wrapped up my first year at Stanford Law School. I'm really looking forward to what we're talking about today, how swearing has changed over the years. One of the things that's really changed in my lifetime, Desmond, is that with the rise of cable television, once we went to non-FCC regulated content, then profanity became a regular part of programming with HBO and Showtime and other. That, to me, kind of broke down the public square use of profanity. Obviously, people have been swearing for centuries, but in the case of public use of it, my sense is that it increased pretty dramatically when the motion picture code fell and profanity started probably in the late 1960s as a regular part of movies. But then when it comes into your home, that's a whole different thing. When it's not edited for television, removing the swearing, and you're seeing the unexpurgated movie, and you're hearing all those words in your own home, and you're watching with your family members, I do think that that lowers the barrier. I think that's right. I think there's a question of degree here. I mean, you can go back to, you know, there's ancient Roman sites that have profanity in, in the graffiti <laughs> on, on the you know, sides of, of various structures. Right? I mean, that's absolutely something that, that humans have been doing for millennia, has is, is been swearing. But in terms of you know, more recent history, I think you're right. Now we have actual audiovisual recorded entertainment that people can stream into their homes, and it's got tons of profanity in it. And we're seeing in journalism, because of social media and digital sites, profanity there as well. I was reading the Los Angeles Times today on their site, and they used a profanity they never would have printed in the paper before that really surprised me. So these barriers are being broken down. I wonder, though, with such heavy use of profanity, whether it diminishes the impact. Because to me, the great power of swearing is in its more occasional use because it really gets attention. It makes more emphatic what someone's saying. I think that's right. You know, Gone with the Winds, uh, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn, is, you know, that's a very poetic line, of course. But it also, for audiences of the Gone with the Wind era, would have been really scandalous, um, you know, to have have damn like that, which is such a mild oath now. These days, it's not even considered profanity, really, uh, you know, compared to, to how it used to be. I think my first memory of profanity was probably your grandfather, my my dad. Uh, he would have been in his very early 20s at this point. I was a little kid standing over the stove in our little uh, apartment. He was pulling a piece of pizza off of a platter that he had just heated up in the oven. And he's let out a F. <laughs> and my mother, John, <laughs> and he said, but I burned myself. And... So I I didn't know what the word meant, but I knew it was a taboo word, and I knew it was related to something extreme happening. But I didn't hear it in the rest of the world. I had to be told the meaning of some of the words by my friends at school because I did. I that's where I heard many of them the first yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, as did I as well. I also was was embarrassingly uh, knowledgeable about some of that stuff. I definitely had to learn from my friends. Now, did then. you have swearing of any of your teachers in school? I did. You know, not really. At all in elementary school and only a little by middle school. But by high school, yes, my teachers definitely were using profanity, as were my peers. And my, my peers have been using it since middle school, but it was, you know, sort of taboo at that time. Uh, in high school, though, 
some of my teachers would use it in the classroom. But there was one other teacher who noted the fact that it was still technically against the student code of conduct and would make students do push-ups when they swore in his presence. I didn't really use profanity at all um, myself at that age, nor do I now, um, but I had some peers who did. So there was this huge dichotomy. Sometimes you could swear in the classroom and not outside of it. And so, <laughs> so it was As I said earlier when we were talking about high school differences, in, in alternative school at Hollywood High School, the teachers swore, not all of them, but the guy who ran the alternative school, man, he had the proverbial mouth of the sailor. He was swearing all the time with a cigarette hanging off of his lips and, man, will sit the F down and, you know, and then we'd all start laughing, you know, and because that was kind of part of the shtick. He'd complain and we'd give him a hard time. Dad, why did he have to ask you to sit down? Were you up and around in the classroom all the time? I was, no, I well, probably I was up. I mean, because it's alternative school. You weren't sitting like in debt. We had couches and beanbag chairs, and it wasn't like a typical high school sitting in rows. I was an irreverent student, but who adhered to rules very well. I, I felt like that gave me the freedom to pop off and to, to say things which might be considered impertinent. Well, in the paraphrased words of George Orwell, if you follow the small rules, you can afford to break the big ones. Well, that's kind of my philosophy uh, in an Orwellian way. I felt very comfortable joking joking about things, or if I felt like I had a good relationship with a teacher, you know, snapping back on something with a line. And so I was probably giving him heck about something, arguing some political issue with him. And so, man, we'll sit there up now, just like he was sick of dealing with me. You know, that was a very different time, of course. It was. It was you know, and, and I think even now, right, I, there's all sorts of, you know, ins and outs of, of um, you know, whether you're going to use it in a classroom or not. Like, a couple of my high school Spanish teachers were real potty mouths, and so they uh, they very much enjoyed teaching us some of the swear words in Spanish, especially explaining the vast linguistic differences in uh, the swear words across Latin American Spanish. So these are regional differences. There are, there are regional differences between them. I've also picked up some new ones from the naturalization clinic where I do some pro bono work. Hopefully not uh, directed at you. Not directed at me, no, directed at the naturalization test. But uh, <laughs> but I have picked up a few of those from Spanish. And uh, when I lived in Sicily uh, over the, the summer of 2023, I uh, did also pick up some Italian curse words Did you well. get the hand gestures along with it? I did. They're required. Support for LAist comes from Cambridge University Press with the new book by Stephen Watts, Citizen Cowboy, Will Rogers and the American People. A compelling look at the life of Will Rogers and how his work helped ease Americans into the modern world. Citizen Cowboy is a probing biography of a folksy humorist whose wit made him a national symbol of common sense, common decency, and common people. To get 20% off Citizen Cowboy, Visit cambridge.org slash citizencb and enter code CITIZEN20. Support comes from the nonprofit Alliance Française de Pasadena, offering French language classes in person and online for all ages and all levels. Enroll now as the fall session begins September 2nd, or take private classes on your own schedule. Learn French with the experts at Alliance Française de Pasadena at afdepasadena.org. You know, I don't know, but you mentioned that you don't really swear or occasionally swear. I swear occasionally, but I like to save it for, you know, when I really want to, when I have something that's important or I really feel highly expressive about it. And I don't like it as a filler word. Plus, I kind of grew up not really swearing, but what about for you? Yeah, I think that's right. I just, I grew up not using profanity, really, and I also grew up feeling like I wanted to, you know, use the full breadth of the English language to express myself. Um, I'm glad that profanity has been democratized to the extent that, you know, people aren't feeling like their identity prevents them from using words that they want to use to express themselves, at least not to the degree that that was the case before. Um, But I am worried that the ubiquity is getting in the way of expression. Yeah, that it's a filler word, like you know or like 
Exactly. Or even that it takes, uh, you know, the place of, of adverbs that you might otherwise use, right? Instead of saying that something is um, exquisitely beautiful, you might say it's so <laughs> effing beautiful. Uh, you know, that I think something is actually, I think something is lost in yeah. changing exquisitely to so effing. Yeah, <laughs> very good point. And I, I think there's a lot of good words to say a lot of good things, you know. You and, wanted to exclaim like a sailor, but not with a swear. Right, right. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Instead I say hark, the albatross. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, so, so no, I, I think uh, I've start using hark. Yes. <laughs> right, 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 right. Dost thee protest? <laughs> um, but no, I, I, I definitely think um, that you know English has plenty of things that you can use to express yourself that aren't profanity, and my comfort with that led to no need to using profanity in in exchange. Do you feel that like that leaves you out or makes you seem precious to your friends? I do get the sense sometimes that my friends really don't expect me to end up having any kind of adult humor when it, you know, when I don't use profanity and they get very, very surprised about that. Like, um, you know, we were, we were, uh, preparing for, for oral argument, uh, in a, you know, a class and I made a, a pun on the word oral, which was well received by my classmates, but they were also shocked <laughs> because you. the, the idea that I would make a joke about oral sex was terrifying to them. They thought it was, they thought it was just like the, you know, I mean, I, I don't know about terrifying, but it was surprising because I'm the person who never uses profanity. So for me to come in and make a joke about oral sex was yeah. really, you know, a stark difference from, uh, from but then that. it carried so much more impact. It did. Your joke. It did. That's right. Because, you know, the fact that Desmond made a joke about oral sex was suddenly... a lot of humor is the shock value of it. You had the shock value, which which I wanted to get to because historically, I think a lot of the value of profanity has been to shock people. It's it can be upsetting and carries a kind of power in that way. Particularly, I think of movies when profanity first came in, people would describe it as vulgarity on the screen when they would when they would swear. We're used to it now, and I wonder. Then as it lost its shock value, and I wonder if some of these extremists on social media who use racist or misogynistic or other, if if in a sense in their mind they're transgressing in the way that profanity used to be transgressive. I absolutely think that's the case. I think slurs are the new transgression compared to profanity because profanity isn't transgressive enough anymore for people who want to transgress. Um, but you're right. It gets much more malicious more quickly. You well, know, and like, it's targeted because if yeah. you're using a slur, it's about someone's identity. Profanity is just generally shocking. It doesn't go after a type of person. That's right. Even if it's individualized, if you're just saying F you to an individual person, they say, OK, you know, whatever. I mean, even even when that was shocking, it still would have been offensive, but it wouldn't have been about an identity-based characteristic. But you call someone a slur about their race or their gender or their sexual orientation, and now suddenly you've stepped into a category where they can't escape because that's their identity, right? They can't just walk away from the FU. Suddenly they hear that slur about who they are, and I think that's a, a much more dangerous, much more hurtful form yeah, of transgression. Yeah, it's, it's a lot more hurtful, but I could see where... The person doing it is looking to get the same charge yes. out of it. And then I wonder, do they fully realize the pain that they're inflicting, or are they just trying to be shocking and not really thinking about the impact on the person? I, I, I wonder as well. I don't know. You know, I've never gone online and made bizarre rants Thank about... Thank you. I <laughs> appreciate that, involving son. ...slurs. Um, but, but yeah, I have to wonder, too, about the underlying psychology of that. Is it just an effort to sort of get the high of transgressing um, and damn the consequences yeah. to the people that, you know, it's harming with those youth? I, I sometimes wonder if those individuals, if you could bring to them a person person who's been maligned in something would in making it more personal maybe they would they would rethink what they did yeah you know i i actually had um, a teacher in high school who was a black woman and was a little upset well actually very upset about some of the kids at school talking about whether they could give their white friends an n-word pass or not like whether black students would be able to sort of license non-black students to temporarily use the n-word and um, she actually spoke in front of the whole school at, at one of our morning meetings and said I remember when I was a little girl and kids called me the N-word when they were driving away on their school bus to a different school that I wasn't able to go to. And, you know, the room was silent, of course, and everybody was like, okay, well, we know what this word means to her. And and I, I did not hear it in the remaining two years I spent there after she said that to our school. 
Desmond, as always, I appreciate learning so much from you, hearing about your experiences and talking about profanity, which leads to some even deeper issues than just uh, offhanded swearing. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us on Passing the Mantle. If you appreciated our segment this week and you want to reach out and share your thoughts on it, we would love to hear from you. You can send suggestions for topics or your feedback to passingthemantle at elias.com. That's passingthemantle at elias.com. Please don't forget to share this with your friends, your peers, your coworkers, and if you don't think they're too damn busy, your family. <laughs> Thanks so much. We'll talk with you next week. Passing the Mantle is hosted by me, Larry Mantle. And me, Desmond Mantle. The show is a production of LAS Studios. This podcast is powered by listeners like you, donating as little as $5 a month. And we can only keep making more episodes like this with your partnership. Support this program now by donating at las.com slash join. Thank you so much. Our producer and editor is Caitlin Plummer, and Megan Larson is our executive producer. Evelyn Bocanegra is our studio technician and helps edit and mix all of our episodes. And Shana Naomi Krokmal is VP of Podcasting at LA Studios. Our theme music is by Errol Ross. This podcast is supported by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe quality journalism makes Los Angeles a better place to live. Support for LAist comes from Cambridge University Press with the new book by Stephen Watts, Citizen Cowboy, Will Rogers and the American People, a compelling look at the life of Will Rogers and how his work helped ease Americans into the modern world. Will Rogers was a youth from the Cherokee Indian Territory of Oklahoma who rose to conquer nearly every form of media and entertainment in the early 20th century's rapidly expanding consumer society. This probing biography reveals a folksy humorist whose wit made him a national symbol of common sense, common decency, and common people, making his fellow Americans laugh and think while honoring the past and embracing the future. Will Rogers helped ease them into the modern world and they loved him for it. Citizen Cowboy is a biography of one of America's most important and popular cultural figures. To get 20% off, visit cambridge.org slash citizencb and enter code CITIZEN20.